Andrew Clavin was raised in a non-practicing Jewish home. For about the first 45 years of his life, he lived as a philosophical agnostic and a practical atheist. Clavin explains some of the steps along his journey that eventually led him to faith in Christ. Jesus never appeared to me while I lay drunk in the gutter. And yet looking back on my life, I see that Christ was beckoning me, beckoning to me at every turn. When I was a child, he was there in the kindness of a Christian babysitter and the magic of a Christmas Eve spent at her, at her house. When I was a troubled young man contemplating suicide, he was in the voice of a Christian baseball player who gave a radio interview that inspired me to go on. And always he was in the day-to-day miracle of my marriage, a lifelong romance that taught me the reality of love and slowly led me to contemplate the greater love that was its source and inspiration. But perhaps most important for a novelist who insisted that ideas should make sense, Christ came to me in stories. Slowly I came to understand that his life, words, sacrifice, and resurrection formed the hidden logic behind every novel, movie, or play that touched my deepest mind. I was reading his story when the logic finally kicked in. It, I was in my 40s, lying in bed with one of Patrick O'Brien's great seafaring adventure novels. One of the characters whom I admired said a prayer before going to sleep. And I thought to myself, well, if he can pray, so can I. I laid the book aside and whispered a three-word prayer in gratitude for the contentment I'd found and for the work and people I loved. Thank you, God. It was a small and even prideful prayer, a self-impressed intellectual's hesitant experiment with faith. God's response was an act of extravagant grace. I woke the next morning and everything had changed. There was sudden clarity and brightness to familiar faces and objects. They were alive with meaning and my own delight in them. I called this experience the joy of my joy. And it came to me again and again whenever I prayed. Naturally, I began to pray every day. This would lead to a full acceptance of Christ as Lord. Later, Clavin wrote a book about his spiritual journey titled, The Great Good Thing. A secular Jew comes to faith in Christ. What a great story. And I read that and I was thinking, I wonder what does your spiritual journey look like this morning? What is your spiritual journey? How did you come to faith in Christ? And the reality is, while each one of us have unique journeys that we're on and our faith journey is different for all of us, in the end, we're all confronted with the exact same gospel that demands the exact same response. That's the simple reality. We are in this series, Easter People, and we are in week three of this series And we're looking at the reality of living in the resurrection, not just one day a year, but every day of the year. Every day, being a a person of the resurrection. And we've talked about a couple things in this series, uh, a couple of different things in this series. Um, First was how this Easter revolution took, took place and how we went from the 500 witnesses shortly after the resurrection to how there are today 250 million people, who, billion people who would say they follow Jesus. Might not all be legitimately say, but they claim to follow him and his teachings. How did we get to that point? And then we looked secondly at the gospel being self-perpetuating. How the gospel within itself is self-perpetuating. It's motivated by love and cultivated by faith and elevated by hope and celebrated in joy and it just self-perpetuates itself. And in the end, we are the witnesses in the end and it self-perpetuates in us as we just live in relationship with Christ. People see our faith and our hope and our joy and our love and the gospel is just self-perpetuated. Well, today I want to talk about responding to the gospel. I mean, if it's self-perpetuating, what does that look like? And what does it mean to respond to the gospel? Think about this big idea because I think it's significant. Every time, every time we respond to the gospel, it is good news all over again. And it's not like we respond to the gospel one time and we're saved and that's it. We can respond to the gospel and the cross and the empty tomb a after day after day after day. That's what it means to live out the gospel and to work out our salvation. Every time we respond to the gospel, we'll see it today, it is indeed very good news. So today I want us to see two sides of the gospel and and really two responses to the gospel. And we're going to take two key elements in the gospel, in, in the Easter story, 
the two central elements really in that Easter story we would probably say would be the cross and then the empty tomb. We're going to look at those and we're going to see what they can teach us about how we respond to the gospel. But let's start here in the scriptures in Matthew 27. Here is our key text today uh, in Matthew 27 verse 45. And now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice, It is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. And in there we see the two elements there. We see the cross that he hung on and then we see a reference to the resurrection. And here's what we want to see. There's two responses to the gospel today. And and this is helpful to us when we want to share the gospel we, we're going to give it to you real clear today. You can share the gospel in this sense as well with others. But it starts here. The cross gives us something to believe. There is something to believe. And we respond to the gospel, to the gospel and we're saved when we respond to the gospel with this sense of belief. There is something to believe. In fact, we can identify four things we need to believe. We need to believe that Jesus is God. Starts right there, believing that Jesus is God. We, we believe the person who died on the cross was indeed God. He was the Son of God, but He was God, one of the, 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 the triune Father, Son, and Spirit, God. This means that um, He was not just a good teacher who was misunderstood. This means that He was not someone who just gave us a noble uh, demonstration of sacrificial love. He did that, but more than that, He is God. Maybe you remember the C.S. Lewis uh, illustration, used it before, that Jesus is one of three things, only, can only be one of three things. He's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he really is God. Because Jesus claimed to be God. So if he claimed to be God, if someone today came and, and, and started going through Grand Haven claiming to be God, we would say either he's a flat-out liar or he's crazy. <laughs> we know he can't be God because we know Jesus is God. But that's the reality Jesus is either a liar or a lunatic or he really is who he says he was. He is God. Secondly, we have to believe. Oh, actually, I was going to notice in the text there that this centurion, he's standing there watching, one of the Roman guards watching the crucifixion unfold. And at the very end, what does he say? Truly, this was the Son of God. Truly, he realizes in that moment that there was something very special about Jesus Christ. He maybe didn't have all his theology down. He may not have understood exactly what it meant to be the Son of God, but he knew, I think, that they had just killed an innocent man. So we have to believe that Jesus is God. We have to believe that he died for sin. He simply did. The question is simple. Why did Jesus die on the cross? He died on the cross because of our sin problem. It says in the text that there was darkness over the, all the land. There was darkness from, from um, well, it would have been actually from, from our time, 3 to 6 in the afternoon was when there was darkness. He was on the cross from 12 to 6. And from 3 to 6, darkness covers the whole earth, basically. Why? Because he was taking on our sin, taking on spiritual death. And if you look in the Bible, the Bible talks about our sin as being both Death and darkness. We're living in darkness. We are spiritually dead. That's how the Bible refers to our sin problem. Jesus took our sin upon him. The light of the world went out as he joined us in spiritual death. 
In fact, Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Because he took on spiritual death, and the wages of sin is death. Ephesians 2, 1, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And that's the beautiful past tense to us today, saying that you were but when you come to faith in Christ, He sets you free from the power of sin. He sets you free from the uh, future of death and gives you life and hope in Christ Jesus. So you must believe that Jesus is God. He died for sin and that number three, the work is done. We respond to the gospel by believing that the work indeed is done. We saw the testimony of the centurion who said, yes, this is the Son of God. Well, think about Here's Jesus' own testimony in the midst of the crucifixion. He says, it is finished. It is finished. The work is done. It was done at that moment on the cross when he bore our spiritual death. It wasn't finished when he went to the grave. It wasn't finished when he rose out of the grave three days later. It was finished on the cross. That's why at the end he says it is finished and he gave his spirit to the Lord and breathed his last. Now there are a couple things here that are, that are interesting that show us how the work was done. First, the curtain in the temple is torn in two. If you notice that in the text, we read that a moment ago. The curtain was torn in two. And this is the, the curtain in the temple. And it's significant because this is the curtain where the high priest would go in behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies. And not anyone could go in there, but he would go in there. If you remember, we've told this before, the story before, there was bells on the fringe of his robe and he would walk and it would jingle. Why was that the case? Because they had tied a rope around his leg and if he was in the Holy of Holies performing the sacrificial duties and uh, he made a mistake and something went wrong, what would happen to him? Well, he would die. Why? Because he was dealing with people's sins and the wages of sin is death. And so God would strike him dead and what they would do is they would take that rope and they would drag him out. And then they would say, next man up. <laughs> How would you like to be that job? I don't, mind being, I don't mind doing this, but I don't think I'd want to be the high priest. That's how serious sin was to God and that's how they dealt with it. And so there, no one could go in there and just get him. They had to drag him out. So that curtain is ripped. Because why? Because the work is now done. It's an amazing thing. Jesus, once for all sacrifice and death, we can now enter the Holy of Holies and have fellowship and communion with God. Let me read it to you in Hebrews 11 and 11. Listen to this. And every high priest stands daily at his sacrifice, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice of, for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified." And down in verse 17, then he adds, I will, remember their sins no, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Any offering for sin. And it's fascinating there just to see that the work is done. One sacrifice for all people, for all sin, for all time. And for 1,500 years, they had been offering animal sacrifices. And Jesus came along and said those sacrifices were no longer necessary. Now, there's something else in the text that's fascinating here. I just blew by it there. Um, that tells us the work is done. See, here's the reality. When the high priest was in there on duty doing these sacrifices, you know the one thing they could not do when they were on duty? They didn't get a break time. They couldn't sit down because they were constantly about the work of offering the the required sacrifices. And um, so when you were on duty, you could not sit down. The work was never done, so you could not sit down. And someone would take your place, and then you could go, and you were off duty for a while. But notice what it said in the text, that Jesus went to heaven, and what did he do? He sat down at the Father's right hand. Why did he sit down? Because the work's all done. Because he offered one sacrifice for all people, for all time, for all sin, and the work is done, and we no longer need any more animal sacrifices. Now, you know what's fascinating? I don't know if you know this or not, but so back in Jesus' day when he was on earth, they were still offering the sacrifices like they were supposed to. Now, 
You know, today they don't offer animal sacrifices. Are you aware of that? That the Jews don't offer them today. You know, you know why or when they stopped offering animal sacrifices? Anybody know? About what year? Within 40 years of the crucifixion, the whole the thing they've been doing for 1,500 years that really had been going on since Adam and Eve, they stopped offering animal sacrifices. Within 40 years. They just all got phased away. The temple got destroyed and, and now they believe they don't need to offer animal sacrifices until their Messiah returns. Isn't that crazy? The Messiah came and he ended them. And, and it's ironic because they don't even know why they don't offer animal sacrifices, but we do. And God's sparing all those animals today saying, you know what, you don't need to do that anymore. How beautiful is that? How amazing is that? And so the cross, we respond, there is something to believe. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. Today, for you and I, there's no work to be done. The work is finished. It's complete. The work of our salvation. Christ did it all on the cross. We simply come to him by faith. We respond by faith and trust in what he has done for us. And yet it is beautiful because look what it goes on to say here. For we are his workmanship. We have his identity. His fingerprints are all over us as believers. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we're created to do good works today, but not his work. We are created to do our work. And then how do we do our work? Look at this. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know how we do our good works? We just naturally go about our life. And they just naturally flow out of us. We just walk in our good works. We don't even struggle to do our good works. It's much like Adam and Eve in the garden who were in the garden and they worked in the garden and it wasn't labor. It was, it was just natural. Just taking care of it. Just, and we naturally live out our faith. Respond to the gospel. We do the good works that God wants us to do or he does them through us and we just walk in them. So we need to believe that, that Jesus is God, that he died for sinners, that the work is done, and then believing that this isn't the end. This is not the end. It is not. And there is something fascinating that takes place as Jesus there is hanging on the cross. Jesus says this. Um, he says this. He says, into your hands I commit my spirit. Even Jesus himself on the cross is saying, hey, I may be dying, but this isn't the end. He's saying, Father, take my spirit. I got a spirit. I got a soul that will live on for eternity. And that's the message there, even on the cross. This isn't the end. I might be dying physically at this moment, but my Father has my spirit. And I will live on for eternity. The gospel actually points us to resurrection. It tells us that this world is not the end. And there's this other fascinating story, if you remember, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, right? There's a criminal on each side of him. And one criminal is like mocking Jesus and making fun of Jesus. And the other criminal comes along and it's fascinating. We don't have time to go through it. But you know, the other criminal, here's what he says. The other criminal basically affirms the entire gospel. He affirms the entire gospel. He says, he, he believes this, this one, this, this sinner that's crucified with Christ. He believes that Jesus is God, that we are sinners, that Jesus was sinless, and that Jesus was dying for us. He believes all, all of that came to, to, came to him when he's hanging on the cross. He expresses the gospel. But here's what he says. He, he says, um, did I put the scriptures on the screen? I did not. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Basically, he's on the cross there and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what does Jesus say to the man? He says, today you will be with me in paradise. Even that criminal affirms, this isn't the end. He may be dying physically, but it's not the end. There is eternity on the other side of this world. And our response to the gospel is to believe that yes, this is not the end. We mentioned that uh, centurion earlier the Roman centurion, remember what he said? Truly, truly this was the Son of God. And there's one glaring error in that centurion statement. Did you catch it? Yeah, truly this was the Son of God. No, he is the Son of God. He's the great I am. He's the eternal God. He is still alive. Yes, he died physically. Yes, he died for the sins of the world. But it's not the end. Just as he said, he rebuilt the temple in three days 
and he came back from the grave. So we see here then that there's this idea of believing and this, this criminal on the cross that says today, you know, you'll be with me in paradise shows us that believing gives way to receiving, that the cross, uh, the cross defaults to what? The empty tomb. The empty tomb is the end of the story, not the cross. And that takes us to our second response. The empty tomb gives us something to receive. The cross gives us something to believe. We have to believe those things. But then the empty tomb gives us something to receive. And there's some beautiful things we can see this morning as we kind of walk through this second point. The cross, something to believe. The empty tomb, something to receive. Even in the midst of this passage on the crucifixion, Matthew gives a nod to the resurrection. He talks about that, that instance there when there was this earthquake and, and the ground shook and then the tombs were split. And then it says that when after Jesus was resurrected from the grave that the tombs were opened and those saints that were dead for how many years, came out of the grave and walked around Jerusalem. Even in the midst of the crucifixion, Matthew is saying that the resurrection of Christ is not just his resurrection, it's our resurrection. And someday he's going to crack open our tomb and we're going to come out. Unless we're fortunate enough that we don't even have to go there, that he comes, comes before we have to go to the grave. But if you have loved ones in the grave, someday he's going to crack that grave and he's going to bring them out to glory. What a beautiful truth. The empty tomb gives us something to receive. Now, let's break this down. I want you to understand what this means about receiving, what this looks like practically as we live it at. A um, couple of illustrations I want to use. First, there's this, this, uh, this illustration. Um, the illustration, number one, it's the folly of separating the law into three parts. So I want you to think about the law a minute, the law versus grace here for a second. We go back to the curtain, right, in the temple, and there's this curtain in the temple, and it's ripped in two from top to bottom, and it signifies that the law's been done away with, that we're no longer under law, we are now under grace. Now, what does that mean, to be, to be under law, or to not be under law, to be under, under grace? One of the ways that people describe it today is like this. They kind of, we kind of divide the law into three parts. And I think I've probably done this in the past and just have come to realize the folly of this. But there's the ceremonial law, the 600 plus rules and regulations that the Jews had to follow. They had to do certain things certain ways. Then there's the sacrificial law, all the animals that they sacrificed for thousands upon thousands of years. Um, and then there is the moral law. And what we do is we divide the law into three parts. And the reason why we do this is simple. It's because we want to say, well, yeah, we're not under law. The law was taken away at the cross, well, at least two-thirds of it were, because we're still under the moral law, right? We're still under the Ten Commandments. That's how we would view that. So I got to thinking about that. Well, is that the best way to view the law? Are we? We could pose it this way. How are we to look at the Ten Commandments today? How, how are we to look at them in the light of grace? If God took the law away, how do we view the Ten Commandments. This is fascinating to think about. I heard a great statement recently, and this gave me some real clarity on this. And maybe it'll open your eyes too. And just as we walk through, this is really cool to walk through this, is we're going to just kind of elevate the Ten Commandments today in, in a way we maybe have never seen them. But think about this. So think, um, while we trust the blood of Christ, do we equally trust the life of Christ. See, if I say that the blood of Christ, I believe the blood of Christ was sufficient to wipe away the sacrificial law and the ceremonial law and it took care of it all. But when it comes to the moral on the Ten Commandments, I say, well, I'm still responsible. You know, I got to keep those laws. I wonder, am I equally trusting the life of Christ? Think about this, the life of Christ. What does it mean? Because see, the response to the gospel is not just something to believe. It is something to receive. I'm receiving something. I'm receiving, for one thing I'm receiving, I'm receiving the very life of Christ. I'm not just forgiven of my sins. I'm fully given the Holy Spirit. I'm fully given Christ who indwells me. So while we trust the blood of Christ, we want to equally trust the life of Christ. 
Now think about this. Here's another question. Do you remember when Jesus is in the Gospels and Jesus comes along and he redefines the law? Remember that? He redefined the law and made it tougher. Remember, remember this? Jesus came along and he said, you know what? The, the law says that you, you shouldn't murder anybody. But I'm going to tell you something. If you just get angry at somebody, <laughs> you broke the law. Or he says, you know, you, you should never commit adultery, but I'll tell you what, if you just lust after somebody, you know what? Yeah, you broke the law. And the question is, why would he do that? Why would he make the law even harder? Isn't Jesus supposed to make things easier? He comes along and says, actually, I'm making the law a little harder. What's he doing? He's doing the same thing that he does in another story. Look at this story. We've, we've used this story a few times recently. And... Uh, fascinating to look at this and to see the different layers of this story. But there's this story, there's this rich young man who comes to Jesus and has this, this question about life. And um, let's just read his story here. Mark chapter 10, and as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not fraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus looking at him loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me And the man left. I got the wrong slide there on the screen. So I'll jump ahead here. Uh, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So here's the story of this man who comes to Jesus and, and he's just like, man, something's not right in my life and I'm just missing out on something. And, and, I, and I just, what is it? What do I have to do, Jesus? And Jesus says to him, well, you know the commandments, just keep the commandments, right? And he said, you know what, I'm doing all that. I got the commandments down. I'm keeping the commandments. What do I have to do? And, and you know what Jesus does that is so shocking here? I don't even know if you knew this. Did you know there was a bonus 11th commandment? Did you know that? It's kind of like, you ever, you ever see these people and their grade point is like 4.2? And I've often looked at that and I'm like, wait a minute, 4.0 is perfect. How can you have a 4.2? How can you be... Better than perfect, you know, basically. Of course, they've done that extra credit or, or whatever. And so here comes Jesus to this man, and this man says, I'm doing all the I'm keeping it all. And so what does ba Jesus basically do? His answer is to give him this bonus 11th commandment. Well, there, there's this commandment you maybe didn't know about. You just got to give away everything you have and come follow me. It's the bonus 11th commandment. And the man goes home feeling really sad. What was Jesus doing in this instance? Same thing when he redefined the law and made the law harder. You know what he's doing? Here's what he's doing. His intent was to make the law impossible apart from him. That apart from him, you can't keep the law. Apart from him, it is impossible to keep the law. And you got this rich young man who thinks he's keeping the law pretty good. Jesus kind of opened his eyes and said, no, you're really not. In fact, did you know that the reality is is that mastering parts of the law can lead to another problem? It can lead to what? Pride. I mean, here you got this rich young ruler. He's got all this money. He comes to Jesus. Jesus says, you got to keep the commandments. He's like, well, I got them down, man. There's 10 of them. I know them all. I'm doing them. I can, I'm good to go. Jesus says, well, then you need the bonus. You need the extra credit. You need the bonus commandment. And he walked away sad because, well, man, I can do the other 10, but that one's too hard. That one's too tough. You know, the truth is, let's all be honest in the room. If I said to you, you had to keep the ceremonial law, you'd say, uh, no, no thanks, please, no thanks. If I said, you got to keep the sacrificial law, you'd say, uh, no, no thanks. If I said, you know what, you got to keep the Ten Commandments, the moral law, you'd say, oh, let me look at it. Oh, I can do that. Tenth, I can do that. I, I can keep from lying and now, okay, I won't, I won't have adultery and I won't, you know, I won't cheat and I won't, okay, I, I think I can do that pretty good, right? That's the way we would look at it. Mastering the law can lead to a sense of pride. 
Let me give you another illustration. Maybe you don't quite get it. I'll give you an illustration, and then hopefully this will make sense. Because the cross is something to believe, and the empty tomb is something to receive. We're receiving the life of Christ. And so, <clears throat> think about this. Say, say a couple's married, so the guy goes to his wife and says, Honey, you know what? I want to do a better job of loving you. So, I was thinking, maybe you could give me like a list, like 10 things. Just, ten, just a comprehensive list of the 10 things that would really say that I love you and you could give me that list. If you would just take, take, a, take a week and put together the perfect comprehensive list of those 10 things that you want me to do. And so she thinks about it and puts together the list and comes back. Now, there's going to be some problems with that approach to that list. First of all, she gives, the, gives him the list and, and what happens when he misses something on the list well, he's going to feel pretty bad. He's going to feel pretty guilty. He's going to feel pretty shame. Oh, man, it's just 10 things, and I couldn't do that. Oh, man, how can I? So this kind of guilt and shame comes sleeping in. The second thing that happens is well, what if something's not on the list? Maybe it would really mean a lot to her, but he's like, well, you know, that's not on the list, so I guess I don't have to do that. It's not one of the 10 things. And it would take all spontaneity out because he might think of something himself. It might be Valentine's Day and he thinks, I should get her flowers for Valentine's Day. And he looks at the list and says, oh, that's not one of her approved holidays on the list. I don't have to do, I don't have to do flowers. Okay. Now what if his wife was really, 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 really smart? And she thought about it a while and came back to him and said, honey, I can't really put together a list of 10 things. I really don't think... I don't think, you know what, you want to love me more? Just, just try this. You know what? Just love me like Jesus would. Just love me like Christ would. Ladies, how do you want to be loved? With a law, a list of 10 things that he has to do? Or like Christ would love you? How do you want to love your wife? Do you want a burdensome list of things to do? Or do you want to love? Do you want actually Christ to love your wife through you? That's the difference today between being under law and being under grace. That's the difference today. And the reality is, is that we will much more fully love and live the life God wants us to live. See, Jesus says, I don't care, even if it's, if it's the Ten Commandments, you can't carry them out without me. And if you think you can, I can give you a bonus commandment and I can prove to you that you'll never, you'll never live a good enough life to appease me. But I can live the life through you. That's the reality. Let me give you two ways so we can elevate the Ten Commandments today because maybe you're thinking, oh, you're saying now we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments and that's really hard, right? That's like, wait a minute, don't tell me I don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. I'm saying you need to look at the law and the Ten Commandments. You need to look at them differently. You need to understand how you fulfill those in your life. I'll give you two ways to elevate the Ten Commandments, okay? First of all, think about this. When you see the Ten Commandments, Simply see Christ. You know what the old, you know the value of the Old Testament? There's a real famous preacher today who's saying that we need to unhitch our Bibles from the Old Testament, our faith from the Old Testament. That the Old Testament is confusing to people and it's hard for people to understand. And we, all we need is the New Testament. He's a very popular guy. I used to really respect and enjoy him. That's so sad. Because you know what the Old Testament does? The Old Testament repeatedly reinforces the New Testament. The Old Testament repeatedly points us to Christ and reinforces the New Testament. So when you see the Ten Commandments, remember that they point us to Christ. Remember that those Ten Commandments, in, in all reality, actually every commandment shows us the character of God. You know, Tell the truth because I'm the truth. Don't lie because I'm the truth. Don't kill because I am life. All of those commandments reflect the character of God. So when you see the Ten Commandments, when you see them posted on some wall, when you see them, think about who they point us to. The one who wrote them and the one who fulfills them in us, Christ. It's not that the Ten Commandments are bad. It's just we need to know how to view them through the spectrum of grace. And then here's the other thing. Think about this. The difference, the, the Old Testament, the difference in the Old Testament between law and grace. Under law, yeah, I had to keep the Ten Commandments. 
I got up every day and I read them and I made sure like the rich young ruler that I was checking them off my list and I was doing what I was supposed to do. That's under grace. Um, okay, got that wrong. Under law, I keep the commands, but under grace, the commands keep me. Under, the, under grace, the commandments actually keep me. What do I mean by that? They keep me. Here's the thing. If you read through Paul's letters, Paul reinforces and restates all of the commandments. They're all in there. He tells us exactly what to do. But, but here's the, re- the reality. Think about when we keep the commandments, when we live the commandments out, when Christ lives the commandments out in us. They keep us. Think about it like this, okay? Jesus says, do not lie because I am the truth. And you know what? The truth will set you free. Obey your parents in the Lord. That's the first commandment with promise. And you know what's the promise of long life? Thou shalt not covet. Why? Because contentment brings happiness. Thou shalt not take the name's Lord in vain. Why? Because there's power in the name of Jesus. Thou shalt not kill and hate because why? Because God is a God of love and forgiveness and anger leads to cancer, the cancer of bitterness that destroys a person from the inside out. All of the commandments as we live them, they keep us, they protect us from all kinds of hardship and all kinds of grief. But the reality is under grace, I'm not keeping the commandments. The commandments are keeping me. My focus is to what? To live the life of Christ. The gospel is something to believe And it's something to receive. I'm receiving Christ. And if I receive Christ and I live Christ every day, you know what? The Ten Commandments will be fully expressed in my life. And they will keep me from a world of heartache and a world of grief. That's the reality. How do we see the Ten Commandments today in the age of grace? We need to see them and understand the impact they have on my life as Christ fulfills them within me as Christ fulfills them within me. I heard someone say recently we often fight today for, uh, to post the Ten Commandments right and, and maybe there's a courthouse and they want to take them down and we rise up and we fight to keep the Ten Commandments or we fight to keep the cross up. You know what? You know what symbol we never fight to keep up? We need to put one of these symbols in our church somewhere. We need a symbol of the empty tomb to remind us that the, the, the gospel is something, the empty tomb is something to receive. That's the power of my life when I receive Christ and when he begins to live his life through me. Let me take us to one last scripture this morning. And I think this is a pretty powerful scripture. Here's our big idea again. Every time we respond to the gospel, it is good news all over again. Every time I believe what Jesus says about me, every time I believe that the work is done, every time I believe that I'm completing Christ, every time I believe that I am forgiven and that I am free and that I am family, every time, that's good news. And every time I receive Christ, every time I just let him live through me, every time, I mean, I don't don't receive him over and over again, but every time I live him out, every time I acknowledge what I have received and that he is my life, it is good news all over again. Colossians 3, 1, if you have then been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Never, Never noticed that extra apostrophe in there. But if you're raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. And and notice, so seek Christ who is above and, and notice what he's doing. He's seated at the right hand of God. God is still sitting down today, friends. He's still sitting down because the work is done. He's still sitting down. He's not up there panicking back and forth in heaven. There's no more work to do. He did all the work. We need to rest in his grace. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Set your mind on Christ. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then will you also appear with him in glory. Wow. What what a beautiful scripture. What a beautiful, what a beautiful, beautiful reality. Let me give you one last thing. So we talk about those commandments again, right? Do I have to keep the Ten Commandments today? Am I under the Ten Commandments today? And that's totally the wrong question. 
you know what? Christ is my life today. He wrote the commandments. He fulfilled the commandments. And you know what he did? Let me tell you what he did that is so mind-boggling. So we said that he goes to this, this, this uh, rich young ruler, right? And, the, and he's kept all the commands. And Jesus says, okay, you know what you need? You need the bonus 11th command. You need to give away everything you have and come follow me. And he couldn't do that. He couldn't do that. You know, there's one person, though, who could do that. You know, there's one person who did that in the Bible. Did you know that? There's one person in the Bible who gave everything away and followed God, and that's Jesus Christ. When he left glory and he came to earth. You want to talk about somebody who can fulfill the law? He gets the extra credit as well. And he will do that in your life. That's my point. He'll do that in your life. He'll help you give everything away and follow God and fulfill the deepest, the deepest, the deepest part of the law. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Oh, this message was so encouraging to me, just reminding me the power I have, the potential that is in me because I have Christ. And we all struggle with sin. We, let's, let's be honest, we all struggle with sin. And sometimes we like to look at a list of 10 things and think, yeah, I, 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 can, I think I can do that pretty good. And apart from you, we can do nothing that's worthwhile, that's good. All our good works are like filthy rags. You are the only good thing in me. You have made me brand new. You have given me new life. I am a new creation in Christ. My old man is gone. So now I can say yes. I am perfect. I am beautiful. I am holy. In fact, you know, the holy of holies dwells right inside my heart. It doesn't get any better than that. I can't get any closer to, to Christ than that. But the holy of holies is right in the very center of my being. And you fellowship with me there every single day. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your hope. And thank you for a gospel that we can believe and a gospel that we can receive. In Jesus' name, amen.